Hello everyone, um, this is an edited version of a talk I gave to the British Society of Underwater Photographers in their regular slot, how I got the shot, um, about my recent um, Lee awarded photo from the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Um, Thank you everyone for inviting me along to talk. I know I'm standing in for Susanna who was supposed to be giving this talk um, but her move around the world has, has left her a bit busy so I, I, I volunteered to stand in and obviously have quite a timely picture to talk about tonight in how I got the shot. Although I'd say that this talk is a little bit more um, how I got the award than how I got the shot. I think this photo is not particularly a technical image to have taken um, but it is interesting that this picture was successful in the, the fiercely competitive Wildlife Photographer of the Year. So that's really kind of what I'm going to focus on talking about today. Um, the Wildlife Photographer of the Year is an amazing competition um, and I'd always encourage any underwater photographer to enter it. Um, and that's partly because I think the, the rewards of winning are so great in that it really is a career changing um, competition but also I think because it's not an underwater photography competition um, often you know quite different types of images are chosen as winners in this competition and as a result I think you know often you can see people you know it doesn't mean that you need to be absolutely the very best in the world to win in it often you know people are successful with with pictures just because they've done something really different and often new photographers are as good at doing that as older photographers um, that's I guess part of the challenge for someone like me is that I think it's a competition that challenges you to constantly come up with fresh ideas because your own success in the past often stops you having success again in the future just because your own style of photography ends up in the seen it before pile um, so just to tell you a little bit about what it's like, the Wildlife Photographer is a very high profile competition and it's a, a fantastic for you as a photographer. I think one of the, the best things you can get out of any photo competition is really good and really strong press coverage. It's just a little bit um, of my picture from this year. You can see here in the Guardian, on the BBC, in the Metro and, and down in the Western Morning News. Uh, which was the 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 the, the, the southwest's um, newspaper it's there on the cover which was quite cool for me because that's obviously a newspaper i grew up with um but the reason this is really valuable to you as a photographer is that it means that in the future when people search for your name as a photographer they don't just find your website they also find all these mainstream media outlets celebrating you as an amazing photographer and that's obviously great if that's how someone is discovering you that they see you being listed as being absolutely fantastic whether you are or not um, the award ceremony itself is also a really special event um, it's based around a single evening um, which is a, a gathering, a sort of a black tie gathering in the main Hintze Hall of the Natural History Museum. And you can see that on the, the left hand side here. But it, it's a gathering also of, of lots of, of really interesting people, editors, publishers, um, but also, you know, amazing photographers from around the world, many of whom don't do any other photographic competitions. And so I think it's, it's always nice to, to see them in the, you know, to, to have the chance to meet these people. You can see Tony Wu there in the top picture. There's Lauren Ballester with, with Isa, um, my daughter on the top right. Um, in the bottom meeting, um, um, Catherine, the Princess of Wales, although she was the Duchess of Cambridge when that picture was taken, is Tim LeMann, um, Bruno Demetrius and me. Um, and, and just, you know, you get the chance to, to rub shoulders with photographers, all of whom are always absolutely thrilled to be there. So it's a very, very happy, place it's so it's regarded by everyone who wins there as the, the sort of the pinnacle of, of such awards so everyone's always excited to be there and it's also more than just that one evening actually the the wildlife photography team organized sort of four evenings of, of events of which the middle evening is the main award ceremony but the following night is a another chance to to see the winning pictures and the and the, the preceding night to the main award ceremony is a photographer's meet and greet so you really do get the chance to spend lots of time with the other photographers in the formal events and also it's very easy to say if you're staying in london for the events to meet up for lunch and things like that it also opens some pretty amazing doors for you as a photographer 
Um, you know, these are two highlights that have come to me from the wildlife photographer. One on the right there, meeting the, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, having the chance to talk to them about my, my snapper photo from many years ago, which was um, in the wildlife photographer. That was a fantastic opportunity for me. And then, you know, another sort of completely surreal event was, was going to, to number 10 with, with David Dublé, who you can see there on, on, the, on the left with Cathy Moran. And, you know, we both had our pictures, um, both David and I had our pictures up in number 10. And, and that was just another completely sort of, sort of surreal experience that just wouldn't happen anywhere else. So that, that's all sort of part of the, the, the charm and excitement of this competition. Um, it also gives you a lot of platform, not just for yourself, but also for your pictures and the things that you care about. And I know many of us really care passionately about the marine world, the underwater world and preserving it. And the platform given by the Wildlife Photographer gives you the opportunity to speak about those things to audiences who, who, who will turn up to see them, whether that's on the TV, that's, that's me this week on Channel 4 News, or um, below, that's the same week, speaking um, to, to the gathering at the RAC Club in London, or on the right there, that's I had the chance to speak at a, a Gaia Earth event to two different age groups of children. Um, underneath the, the globe there, which was just another amazing location to, to be able to speak and talk about uh, marine life and marine conservation. And I think those are the sorts of doors that, that um, the competition opens, not just for you as a photographer, but for your image and the messages behind your image. Um, I want to get on and talk about the photo now. Um, I took the picture in Lembe Strait in Indonesia, in North Sulawesi, as, 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 as I think most of you know. Um, it was taken on a dive site called Batu Sandar, which is on the Lembe Island side um, of, of the strait. And it, it's an area um, where you have shallow patch reefs behind some rocky island there. And then it breaks down into sort of a sandy slope and then you get um, deeper reefs further down. And this photo was taken on the deeper reefs area. Divers usually go there. It's a very good site for nudibranchs, for pygmy seahorses, for anemone fish, that sort of thing, and, and all the other critters. Um, I've written on here, not pointed out by a guide, and that was really just to point out the fact that I you know, think the dive guides in Indonesia and Lembe are amazing, and many of them are old friends, and I love diving with them. But I think it's also important for you as a photographer not just to be obsessed with always just being with a guide and shooting what they tell you to shoot because otherwise you will end up with the same photos that everyone else gets I mean dive guides learn what photographers like and they show them those same subjects and these particular subjects were not pointed out by a guide they were subjects I found myself now every dive guide in Lembe could find these subjects straight away without question um, but they probably wouldn't point them out to you because they feel they're a bit too everyday, a bit too ordinary. But I saw the photographic um, potential in them, and that's why I um, shot these particular subjects. And I think that that's an interesting point in that just, I think, I find a lot of photographers, when they go to Lembe, they're obsessed with having a private guide and, you know, always being, you know, always having the best guide possible for them. And, and those are things are important. But I'd also say to people, you know, have a day when you're, diving in a group of maybe four photographers to a guide and you've you've got to find things for yourself a little bit and maybe some of those subjects will actually hold you in very good stead in terms of your portfolio at the end because you'll shoot things that other people maybe wouldn't have thought of shooting or the guide certainly maybe wouldn't have shown you. Um, I think the other interesting point um, with this um, shot, I'm just going to move slightly, I think I'm catching the wind a bit here. Um, I'm outside, as you know, doing this, this presentation here, sitting outside. Um, the other thing I'd say what's interesting about this shot is it's not that classic macro shot that we tend to chase as underwater photographers. These are two pictures of, of gobies, um, similar sort of subject matter to the ones in, in the wildlife photographer picture. And I would say that both of these are classically stronger underwater photos. One is, is very graphic, uh, well, they're both, you know, graphic, simple compositions, eye-catching compositions. Both of these would certainly get more likes on Instagram than my wildlife photographer picture um, because of their graphic strength and their immediacy. But I think that you often need a little bit more than that in the wildlife photographer. 
it's not a competition that tends to reward the same types of pictures that get rewarded in other underwater photography competitions or get favored on social media and you can see this is a much more complicated image it's you know takes a little bit more time to digest and enjoy but i think there's more here to enjoy and, and that serves it well in terms of the composition competition so to talk a bit about how i shot it um when i found this these gobies on the coral i was obviously drawn to the attractiveness of the coral so i wanted to make that part of the picture and i started off shooting single gobies with the attractive coral around them um and i felt this was a perfectly good picture i've processed this picture it's it's part of my my stock collection and everything i, I like this shot but it's not a special shot um, but then I felt that when I saw that orange coming through on the camera, I thought, wow, wouldn't that look great against the blue of the water? And so the main sort of camera change I made was to slow my shutter speed down in order to get that blue coming through. And I think that creates a, a lovely color contrast with the red orange of the, the coral, which is really at the heart of, of the visual impact of this picture. I then spotted there were more gobies around and decided to, to increase my framing to allow those to, to get into the picture. So the picture was taken pretty standard shot. I think most people could, could shoot this shot fairly happily. Shot with a Nikon D850, 105mm lens, super housing, retro flashes. Um, the only unusual thing was slowing down to that eighth of a second shutter speed. Now I could have gone to a higher ISO to get that blue, but actually I like using these long exposures. They often add a little bit of, of just motion and texture into the picture. I wasn't trying to create a motion picture. I wasn't panning the camera or moving the camera or anything. I was holding the camera still, using the stabilizer of the lens to give me a sharp image, but allowing just a little bit of movement to come through around the polyps and things. And it just creates, I think for me, a very painterly effect on the polyps that just is more interesting than if I just bumped the ISO up. So just because our cameras are great at higher ISO these days, doesn't mean it's always the best solution. Sometimes that long exposure can be, can be a really good solution. So the other thing I need to mention is that I cropped the picture for the Wildlife Photography of the Year. This is the original frame as shot. And this is the version of the picture that I have on my website and it's on Nature Picture Library's website as well. Um, and, and, and what you'll see, the main difference is if you look in the top left hand corner, there's the head of a fourth goby coming into the frame, which I rather liked. I didn't spot it when I was shooting it. I have to say it was an accidental inclusion in the frame, but I rather liked it and I've always left it in. I like the fact that it implies that there are even more gobies on this 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 sea fan and that this this tale, this story goes on and on and on beyond the, the bounds of the picture. And I like that aspect of the picture. But I felt when I went to reprocess this picture for the competition, and I, whenever I enter pictures in the wildlife photographer, I always go back to my original raw files and reprocess them out. And that's just really just to make sure that I haven't removed any specks of backscatter or something in, in Photoshop. And so by going back to the original raw, I never remove backscatter in, in Lightroom. So I can go back to those original raw files. It was all processed already. Um, but um, it meant that when I processed it back out again, it came out looking exactly the same, but I knew that I could start afresh knowing that there wasn't some minute piece of backscatter that I'd remove, which the competition wouldn't like. Um, but what I did decide when I reprocessed it, that I felt that that goby in the top left corner just felt too much like a mistake. Um, and I felt that the judges might go against the picture because of that. So I chose to crop the picture like this. So just cropping a little bit off the top and the left, um, and that allowed me to get that goby out of the frame. Um, I think the, the, the three gobies line up nicely now across on a diagonal as well. Um, but it was more about getting rid of that, 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 that other goby out of the picture. And I think that um, the picture now it doesn't have anything controversial in the frame. Whereas I think that other thing was probably a love or hate inclusion and it wasn't worth the risk in terms of the competition to, to keep it in um, you're not allowed to clone things out in these competitions but you are allowed to make small crops to the image um, this is kind of the level of crop that we probably do in the old days of slide film just by simply sliding the the transparency up in the slide up and to the left inside the slide mount and it would hide those those unwanted objects around the edges of the frame um, so they've always allowed a little bit of cropping um, I think the other way to appreciate this picture is to look at the other pictures awarded in the wildlife photography this year. And there were only eight underwater images awarded in the wildlife photographer. Um, these two were both category um, winners and, and the one on the left, Lauren Ballester's um, horseshoe crab, was also a um, was the overall winner of the competition. Um, but I think what you'll see is that there's none of these pictures are classic scuba diving pictures, certainly not classic coral reef 
scuba diving pictures. Um, these, these are the others, these are the commended images across all the categories of the competition. And eight's a very low number of underwater pictures anyway, but you can see that mine is really the only one that's a classic coral reef diving shot. And that's quite normal. Um, the, the, um, you know, the shots here, we've got freshwater shots, top left and bottom right. We've got big animal snorkeling, which is very common in the wildlife photographer, um, with the right with southern right whale on the top right. We've got a Mediterranean um, shot, top middle, and then a black water shot, bottom middle. Um, you know, so but I think there's a message in that that is very common. It's very rare that classic coral reef diving pictures are awarded in the wildlife photographer. And when they are, I've often been the photographer who's taken them. Um, so it's, it's actually one of the hardest types of underwater pictures to win. People often say it's easy to win with underwater pictures in the wildlife photographer. It's not. The wildlife photographer is challenging photographers to show them something new from the underwater world. And I think there's a feeling that there's not so much new from coral reefs. So it's often pictures from other environments that tend to do well. Um, I think the other reason there were relatively few underwater pictures in this category in this year because five of the, the awarded pictures came in the underwater category and there were only three you know, underwater awards given beyond the underwater category, which is relatively low, is that this year there was a very high number, seven um, pi uh, pictures that are taken of, um, of underwater subjects, but through the surface. All these pictures are underwater subjects, all photographed through the surface. And the rise of drones particularly perhaps makes these pictures more common than they ever used to be. Not that that many of these are actually drone shots, but I think it's, it's an interesting point. So I don't think necessarily there'll be less and less underwater pictures awarded for the next few years as a trend. Um, I just think this year they, the judges particularly went for these types of pictures and probably got a little bit obsessed, you know, like a judging room sometimes can with these types of shots. I think they are very interesting shots, all of these. I, I you know, three of these are category winners. And the top right one is, is, is probably one of my favourite shots from the, the competition. So a really, you know, great selection here. So very justifiable, but yeah, unusual to see so many shots of a, of a similar style being awarded. Um, the way I often obsess, um, assess my pictures for entering in the competition is, is a twofold one. And it's a very simple technique. And it's simply that does the picture work small and then does it work better big? And so the way I judge if a picture works small is I, I put the picture small on my screen, just using the Lightroom grid or something like that. And the pictures that catch my eye, they're likely to be ones that will catch the judge's eyes and won't get knocked out in the early round rounds of the competition. And th this is something that's very important for big competitions like UPY or WPY that are judged with multiple passes by the judges. Smaller competitions that are often only looked at once or twice, the initial impact is probably the most important thing. Um, but I would say for the bigger competitions, you want that initial impact. And I don't think that my coral shot has amazing subject initial impact, but the color combination of the, the orange and the blue and the white, I think does really r demand a second look. So I think it got through those early rounds because it just looked so interesting graphically. People were, oh, let's have a look at that bigger. And then when they did look at it bigger, hopefully they got more from it. So for me, the rule is you want a picture that grabs attention when it's small, but when it gets bigger, it isn't just the same shot again, but bigger. It actually starts to give you something more. Maybe there's beautiful details in the, 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 in the, in the subject. Maybe there's an interesting pose in the subject, or maybe as there is in this picture, a lot more detail is revealed when you start to see it bigger. Because these pictures are gonna be looked at by the judges multiple times through the rounds. And the more times they look at them, you want them to get new things from the shot. That gives your picture a chance to rise and rise and rise in the competition and be rewarded. Um, and, you know, and even so, you know, when they come back and look at it again and again, they start to see, you know, really interesting textures or or unusual things going on. Like this um, little goby's got a, a copepod parasite on it. Those are just nice little tweaks that sort of when the, when a judge is looking at a picture for a seventh, eighth, ninth time, they start to notice those details and, and they love what they originally loved about it. But then they find new things to like as well. And that's a, a good recipe for success. Um, I'm very proud of having had such a great track record in this competition. Um, but I always try to enjoy each time I'm awarded as if it is the last, because I, I think the moment you start to think about how many amazing nature photographers are, there are in the world, how many fantastic shots the best of those create every single year, you very quickly get very large numbers. 
And then there's all the photographers you never heard of who are also doing absolutely amazing work. And I think every time you manage to squeak into this collection is something to be to be celebrated. Um, I've managed it a lot, um, but I'm pleased to say over the last 20 years. And I'm particularly proud, as I said before, that a lot of those are with pictures taken of subjects that everyone has seen. And I think that's a, an exciting, you know, for me, that's as, as big a satisfaction as winning. I think, you know, if you get the first picture of hippos underwater, you should expect to do well in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. That's, you know, that's an amazing thing. Um, if you go and see something that everyone has seen, you really have to create something really special photographically in order for that picture to appeal. And I'm very proud that a lot of my pictures fall into that, that latter category. Um, and um, I've been awarded now, I think, in... In, well, I've been awarded in eight different categories of the competition, plus People's Choice. So it's nine if I count People's Choice um, as well. And um, yeah, I'm really, really pleased with that um, return. Um, so although this year the underwater pictures were mostly awarded in the underwater category, I will always enter my pictures into a wide range of categories in the competition. Now, maybe the next few years will prove that's not a good tactic. But I always like it if my underwater pictures can be measured against land pictures rather than just purely underwater pictures. Um, and I think I would extend that invitation to everyone to say that this is a contest that you've got to be in it to win it. And despite all the success I've had, and um, just in the last five years, I've, um, I've, I've been awarded four times. I'd, I'd, I'd say that this is true of me and true of everyone is that every photographer is probably entering as many shots as they can. So I think you're allowed to enter 20 images for those. So for those five years, I've entered 100 photos and I've been unsuccessful with 96. So, you know, although I, people say, oh, Alex, you have so much success in your in, in wildlife photography. What's your secret? The reality is I've probably had more failures than anyone else as well because I've had 96 failures in those 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 out of those 100 pictures I've entered over the last five years. So um, you've got to be in it to win it. You put in all these pictures, you put thought into each one as to why you might want to enter it. Um, but you you'd certainly need those numbers, I think, as well to win. So um, you can't, you know, it's certainly not a case I put I've put four pictures in in the last year, um, last five years and, and, and one with all four. Uh, I've, I've certainly filled out my entry each year and it's often not the one you were expecting that does well. So hopefully that's given you some insight into my shot and particularly into some insight into why I think it, it won. Um, I chose not to speak to the judges this year about why what they liked about my picture. Um, I think partly that's because actually the judging took place back in February and March and it's a long time since they've seen these pictures. So I don't feel that they've got, you know, they'll necessarily remember exactly what it was in the judging room. And I prefer to sort of analyse it a little bit myself like I have done. And I always think quite deeply about the entries in this competition because I think that helps you when it comes to entering the next year as well. So I do encourage you to get your pictures out there and get involved. It's an amazing experience if you happen to be lucky enough to get awarded. And if you are, make sure you enjoy it because you never know if it will ever happen again.